Hi, Jennifer Stewart here today, and I'm so excited to have Alfie Cohn as part of my Peace and Joy Parenting interview series. So um, I just wanted to give a quick introduction about Alfie. He has an amazing list of things that he's done. So um, Alfie Cohn has written 14 books on education, parenting, and human behavior including Punished by Rewards in 1993, The Schools Our Children Deserve in 1999, Unconditional Parenting, 2005, The Homework Myth in 2006, and The Myth of the Spoiled Child, his most recent one in 2014. He's appeared twice on Oprah, as well as on the Today Show, and many other TV and radio programs. His articles include Five Reasons to Stop Saying Good Job, how Not to Teach Values, and Atrocious Advice from Super Nanny. Cohn works with educators and parents across the country. He lives actually in the Boston area and virtually at alfiecone.org. So welcome, Alfie. How are you today? Thanks. Doing fine. Thank you. Good. I'm glad to uh, be chatting with you. So um, I, as a teacher, have been working with families and parents for a long time, and I really find fascinating a lot of your um, often controversial ideas on a lot of parenting topics. So um, one of the things that I think parents often struggle with and I'd like to get your opinion on is how can they balance uh, setting some boundaries without you know, making a hard line for their kids, you know, allowing them to have some say, but also, I mean, there are certain things that are non-negotiable like wearing your seatbelt or brushing your teeth or things like that. So um, what, what, what's your take on setting a healthy, kind boundaries? <laughs> well, I can only offer the broadest sort of guidelines that inform those decisions rather than being able to give a five point specific plan in advance for people I don't know and for the sure. vast number of possible situations that might come up. But I think our default should be let kids make decisions unless there's an extremely good reason to take that uh, opportunity away from them. Okay. So going in, the point of departure is um, allow kids to have some autonomy about the uh, issues that affect them. And uh, there should be a damn good reason for you to decide things for them. And of course, that will vary uh, whether there is such a good reason, depending on the circumstances and the age of the child. Sure. I'm in agreement with you, for example, about, about seatbelts. But there's a vast number of, of situations where we just assume, obviously, the kid's too immature or, for whatever reason, can't make those decisions. We have to control them. Where I think our first step should always be to ask, why is that? Um, when kids don't do what we've asked them, a lot of the times it's not because there's a problem with the kid, but with what we have asked, or right. more accurately commanded. Sure. Um, and so we should ask whom this benefits and what's really going on. And even when we've decided it is non-negotiable, we owe kids an explanation for why they have to do something or can't do something. Sure. And we should give them maximum opportunities to make decisions around the edges. Kid has to brush your teeth. Um, let's ask, do you want the blue toothbrush or the red one? Do you want the, the one you move or the one that's electric? Do you want me to do this for you if the child's young or you want to do it yourself? You want to do it now or in 20 minutes? Maximize the autonomy even if the fundamental um, expectation is is a must. Sure, yeah, no, definitely. We, I agree with that. Always trying to offer choices, hopefully um, all the choices that the adult is okay with the child choosing one. So not, you know, do you want to eat the, uh, the broccoli or the brownie um, for dinner? <laughs> but um, Well, although uh, I think a lot of times parents let themselves off the hook too easily by only letting kids um, make decisions where they don't care about the option. So especially as kids get to be three, four, five, and older, uh -huh. um, it's not genuine choice if the kid doesn't have the opportunity to do some things that you're not sure you're comfortable with. 
um, where you do care. Um, otherwise, you're still controlling the child in meaningful ways. And as kids get older, it shouldn't be just a selection from, an op from a series of options on a menu. We should be giving kids the chance to construct options to, to, uh, to ask, where would you like to go? Or what, what do you think makes sense here? Not just do you want A, B, or C from my pre-approved list. I mean, basically, the question we should be asking as parents and asking of parent advisors like, like me is not, how do I get my kid to do what I want him to do? The question we should be asking is, what do kids need? And how can I help to meet those needs? And one of those needs is to have a meaningful impact on the things that affect the child to have that sense of genuine autonomy, that this is my life. I'm not just a um, wholly owned subsidiary of my parent. And if you're not a little bit uncomfortable about the extent to which kids make decisions, you're not doing it right. Sure, well, and then I think, you know, um, as, as an educator and as a parent to three kids, um, I think then it comes up, you know, the question of at what point if we allow them to just all day do whatever they, you know, choose within reason, safety reasons and such. Um, at what point are we teaching them to maybe um, have an issue with being respectful in a school setting um, where they're, you know, going to be required to do certain things in a public school, um, you know, or just, I guess, fitting into society at some point. I mean, I, I think it's great when little kids, you know, dress themselves and do certain silly things, but I don't know, I guess, you know, it's like at what point is it just becomes, I, I don't you know, just. Well, I'm not sure that, or, I'm not sure the problem is that they're not taught to be respectful. I think the question it sounds like you're asking is, to what extent are we going to expect them to be mindlessly obedient in an authoritarian setting? And it may be that that setting and expectation is the problem. The last thing we want to do is what doesn't make sense for healthy child rearing in order to get kids acclimated to a situation that's problematic. Sure. So there will be give and takes no, to, to be clear about how to deal with it, but going in, our question should always be, is this a reasonable thing to ask of kids in a school setting? Not to treat that as a fact of life into which our kids have to be have to be uh, prepared to accept. Um, and there's give and take. Different schools and different teachers have different expectations, and some are more reasonable than others. Of course. If you get an unreasonable teacher or, yeah. or school, that's the problem. And then the question parents should be asking is, how can I mobilize and organize other parents providing educators with research um, and good theories and alternatives in other schools to change that system rather than to treat it as a given. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Yeah, that's a large undertaking, though, of course. <laughs> it is a large undertaking, yeah. absolutely. And our kids deserve nothing less than that, large, um, than that large undertaking. And it can be done in various ways, and we may have to pick our battles, to be clear. And when kids decide that something is unreasonable, they may make they should make that known in a respectful way but the, what we don't want to do is what i call the goody which is a silly acronym that stands for better get used to it which is where we say to kids in effect people are going to do unpleasant and pointless things to you later so we're going to prepare you now by making you do unpleasant or useless things to begin with so, for example, um, no research has ever found any benefit to homework of right. any kind before kids are in high school. So, and even in high school, newer research is raising questions about whether it's really necessary to make kids work what amounts to a second shift when they get right. home from a full day in school. Well, and I so, think, yeah, part of the problem sure? with that, right, is the states have put so much um, that the kids have to learn that I think some of the teachers sometimes are, they don't even know how to get that all in in a day, unfortunately. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we could back up with that. A, yes, you're right. The problems of top-down, one-size-fits-all, test-driven standards and expectations, absolutely a problem that we should be fighting. B, even if you temporarily take that for granted, homework doesn't help. And my expectation is that when teachers say, I don't have time to do everything, I always ask them, how much time would you need before you stopped making kids do stuff at home? And they don't have an answer to that because it keeps growing. Like if I get a bigger desk, all the stuff I have expands to fill that too. Right. So the best teachers never give homework, especially below the high school years, because they know the point is not covering a bunch of facts, but helping kids to be discovering ideas. But in any case, my point here in the context of parenting is somewhat more limited. When you show people that homework for elementary school and middle school kids is all pain and no gain. They sometimes say, we're gonna force them to do it anyway to get them ready for it when they get it in high school. Right. We're gonna undermine the quality of their learning and their interest in learning when they're young so that they will not question the fact that this is a part of life later. The same thing is true of grades. There's no possible reason to give kids letter or number grades. The research clearly shows that that makes kids think in a more superficial way, choose easy tasks, and become less interested in learning. And when you show people the research, grades are unnecessary for reporting to parents how things are going, and all they do is kill curiosity. The response again is, they're gonna get grades later. Let's do it to them now. This is true of standardized testing. Sure. We wanna make sure that just because some schools have unreasonable expectations of mindless conformity, that we as parents don't become worse parents by becoming more authoritarian, claiming that we're gonna be benefiting them somehow because now they won't be surprised when people treat them badly and don't give them a choice later. Sure, well, and I think that's why we might be seeing, a, at least I see a large movement in homeschooling and alternative schooling. Um, where I am, because it's hard. It's hard to fight that in the public schools. And there are still so many parents that I think that really believe that homework is necessary to teach them discipline. And I mean, I know all things that you don't agree with, but um, yeah. But so I would love these parents who have that strong commitment to do this, to stay in the public schools, to make them democratically, so democratic institutions that are critical, that are better rather than draining off the kids and the parents who have the right values and who are outspoken enough so that that makes it even worse for the people who don't have an exit. Yeah, yeah, it, it's hard though out there. <laughs> it's a tough battle for sure. Um, so, and I know I wanted to touch on today, there's several things I wanna to touch on. Um, another thing is I know you are a strong proponent of um, that giving, carrots or rewards for certain things is just the same as punishments or you know removing things and um, so I, I would like if we could touch on and how do you propose parents to kind of get their children to I guess make good choices or um you know I would want to use the word cooperate which I know you <laughs> would be opposed well to. I love the word cooperate if by cooperate we mean work with others Sure. But if you are using cooperate as a euphemism for obey, then so. yeah. be my earlier comments about what's our goal here, right. right? In other words, if you, first of all, let's be clear about why rewards and punishments don't make sense. Um, saying to kids, do this, or here's what I'm going to do to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actively make you unhappy to teach you a lesson. <laughs> right. and because I don't like to think of myself as punitive, I use a euphemism like, consequences to describe right. making kids unhappy. Uh, and on the other hand, do this and you'll get that, which mm -hmm. is a reward or a bribe. Um, these are both ways of doing things to children. Mm -hmm. And the goal in both cases is not to help kids become independent thinkers or caring, compassionate people. It's to get them to do what we demand. Right. And in the long run, both aren't even terribly effective even at that. Right. Um, they certainly don't help kids reach more ambitious goals as human beings. 
um, or as thinkers or learners. Right, they're losing the self-motivation, right, at that point. That's right. And you, the research consistently shows that the more you reward kids for doing something, the more they tend to lose interest in whatever they have to do to get the reward. So for example, studies have shown that if you reward or praise kids when they're helpful, when they share or do something caring, they tend to become more selfish as a result because you've taught them that the only reason to do nice things for other people is so that they'll get a sticker or a pat on the head or a patronizing good job or a dollar or a whatever, yeah. right? So now they're more focused on self-interest as opposed to something else. If you reward a child for reading a book, they become less excited about reading because you've taught them that books are just a means to an end. And the end is whatever the prize is. You have devalued the thing that you've asked or required that they do. What punishments and rewards do very effectively is fray your relationship with the child. Now the child no longer sees you as a caring ally, but as, in the case of someone who punishes, an enforcer to be avoided. Sure. Or in the case of a rewarding parent, as someone reinforcing them as a goodie dispenser on legs. You know, yeah. what do I, how do I have to please you to get the goodie? So in so many different respects, rewards and punishments actively move us in the wrong direction and make it less likely we can meet our long-term goals. The only slight problem, which is baked into your question, is then how do I make them do whatever I unilaterally demand if I no longer can bribe or threaten them? Into well, or how do we encourage them to be kind and to make good choices in life? Um, you know, it's, it's, of course you want to be like, when you're proud of them, you know, oh my goodness, I'm so glad you did that. But I know you're saying that that's then encouraging them just to be seeking the, the praise as opposed to doing that. And you can see, you can get an immediate feedback as to whether it's had that effect. If they're now looking to you, literally and figuratively, for your approval, you've got a problem. Unless How it else makes do you encourage it? What's that? How else do you encourage the, the good choices and the kind behavior? What's, what's your recommendation? Um, first, I, I might just uh, watch, and it might not be necessary. The notion that we have to actively reinforce or encourage kindness, otherwise it won't happen again, it was a fluke, represents a very dark view of children, and by extension, human nature. Some of the people with the squeakiest, good job, I really like the way you shared your brownie with Diane, have the darkest, most cynical view of kids. They believe kids are naturally selfish and bad, and unless you give them that artificial reason to do it again, they won't. So sometimes, shut up and watch. A second possibility is simply describe what you've seen. I noticed that you did X. Um, or I noticed that you, when, you sh when you shared your truck, um, uh, with, with, with Bruce, that he was able to play too, and it seemed to make him happy. Did you notice like that? that? And a third possibility is to ask questions. Um, why did you decide to share? Or why did you decide to read? Or what was going on in your mind? You know, when my, when my daughter uh, drew pictures, which she loved to do, I didn't say, oh, you're such a good artist, you're so pretty, which is stealing from her the the pleasure uh, of evaluating what she did and deciding how to feel about it. Now I'm teaching her, this is just a means to an end. Look at daddy's face for approval. So what I said to her instead is, I, I noticed you drew toes on those bears. Um, how, did, how did you figure out how to do that? That pulls her back into the art itself. So you can offer informational feedback and thoughtful questions without ever doing, I mean, praise is not encouragement. Praise is judgment. Okay. And what praise does, like other positive reinforcement, in addition to undermining interest in the task itself, is one other thing that I need to mention here mm -hmm. that I didn't figure out when I had written my first book about this. Years ago, I wrote a book called Punished by Rewards that talks about what's wrong with rewards and also punishment. But years later, I, when I, in, in writing another book called Unconditional Parenting, I realized that there was a whole new level of problem with praise 
and with punishments like time out, mm -hmm. which is that they communicate conditional affection. Strings are attached. I give you my care, my excitement, my approval, my acknowledgement, my attention, only if you've earned it. You have to jump through my hoops to get all that stuff for me. And if you fail, then I literally cast you out and exile you, which is what, I mean, time out is, is forcible isolation of little children when they need us most. What kids need from us, among other things, is not just love. It's knowing that we love them for who they are, not for what they do. Sure. So we need to make it clear to them to the point that they understand that no matter what they do, we will never ever stop caring about them. When we praise them for doing something impressive or worse, complying with us, we're telling them, first of all, not just that we overvalue mere obedience, we're telling them this love comes with strings attached. And that's the opposite of what we of what kids need to be sure. to flourish. Sure, definitely. Yeah, no, and I, I've, um, for people that want to follow up more on this, um, not that we're done chatting yet, but I know you have a lot of research in your books to back all this up. So it's not just your opinion. <laughs> no, I didn't make this up in the shower this morning. Yeah. And all my books come with very long bibliography so that people can keep me honest and go check out the original sources. I'll be damned. Here's the study that shows kids becoming more selfish when you praise them for caring. I'll be damned. Here's the research on how grades of all kinds undermine kids' interest and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, definitely. So that kind of um, leads me to uh, one of, I think, one of the biggest questions I get asked um, working with parents with young children is yeah. like, what in the world are they going to do then when their child is in the midst of a huge meltdown and it's during something they need to be at? Maybe the parent is trying to get the kid to daycare so they can get to work or, you know, they have to be at school or they're going to be in trouble if they're not there. Something that's, you know, you have to go. It's not like, you know, we're going to go to the grocery store, but it's not the best choice in time and you can do that later. That's an obvious, more of an obvious fix. But how about... Well, I mean, from a purely timeouts are bad. So what do we do? <laughs> from a purely well, it, it's not just that timeouts and other punishments and rewards are manipulative and disrespectful of children, which which I think is the case. Right. In the long run, they backfire. Sure. You know, in the long run, it makes your job as a parent worse because of how your child comes to look at you, and because you haven't gotten to the the source of the problem. I mean, if a kid is having a meltdown going to school, you know, e even if you were prepared to sacrifice your relationship by doing something that was based on pure power tactics, you have to go tough, cry it out, whatever. Yeah. Um, although my heart breaks even saying that. Um, the reality is you haven't gotten to where the problem is. You haven't solved the underlying issue and it's going to happen again and again and again. You're going to have a miserable kid on your hand, and you're also going to have more of these challenges as a parent to have to deal with. Yeah. What's going on here is the question. Never ask the question about changing the behavior. In fact, I came up with this rule of thumb that the, the value of a parenting resource is inversely related to the number of times it contains the word behavior. Okay. Because if you're focused just on the, the act that you can see and measure, you are losing track of the motives and values and reasons that underlie behaviors. You're not dealing with the child anymore who chooses to act in a particular way or gets swept along. Sometimes we use choose in a kind of pejorative, punitive way. Like, I want to see better choices from you. That means I want to see you doing what I've chosen for you. <laughs> you know, or, or we say you've chosen to track the mud in again, you know, which is basically just a way of trying to justify our punishing the child in advance, especially with young children where it often doesn't feel like a choice for them because they may not have the skills to do it that way. But anyway, put that aside. We have to try to figure out what is animating the way kids act. 
Maybe the child is afraid of the teacher. Maybe the child doesn't get enough time with mom and is reluctant to call that to an end. Maybe the kid really has a stomach ache. Maybe the kid is being bullied by other children. Maybe each of those possible explanations for what the kid is doing calls for an entirely different course of action. Rewards and punishments are so appealing because they don't require that we think. It doesn't take any talent or care or yeah. skill to say, if you show up on time without making a fuss, here's what I'll give you. Or if you don't do this, here's what I'm going to do to you. But the reality is that those don't solve the underlying problems. And I can't tell you if the kid is, is, is throwing a temper tantrum about going to school in the morning what to do, because it that depends on this child, this day, and this activity, and what the reason is. We've got to do our best to figure out why it's happening, which made for very young children who can't just always tell us. To, right. we, have, we have to become detectives. And then we may have to say, it's ultimately more important that I that my child feels heard and listened to and respected and cared about unconditionally by me, even if it means I'm late for work once in a while. Yeah, well, hopefully you can keep your job. <laughs> I hope so. Depending on, yeah. Now, something that's, um, I, I'm curious on your opinion on, um, I'm not sure if I heard you discuss this or not in any of the um, videos I've watched of you, but um, so I've been noticing something kind of, different that I feel like, you know, with so much technology and so much busyness going on in our lives that um, parents are often not having a, a great relationship with their kids. And it almost is, um, as opposed to being authoritarian or just whatever, they're sometimes they're almost afraid of, of their children and they're coming to me, you know, their, their kids are just, I don't know, screaming all the time and things like that. So it's almost like the parents, it seems like when the kids are coming to school sometimes that they're just completely ignored sometimes because the parents don't even know how to interact with them. Um, I don't know if you've noticed anything like that. You know, it's as opposed to them saying, you know, I'll let you do what you want because it's making you happy. It's like, I'm just going to do absolutely nothing because I have no idea how to interact with you. Um, I, I, yes. There, once again, what you put your finger on, even though you might not have meant to, is that the behavior is not the point. It's the reason for the behavior. So parents might hold back and um, do something hands off for a wide range of reasons, right? One is, as you said, because I'm, why, why bother to intervene? You're doing what you like. If nobody's getting hurt, it's making you happy. Or another reason is over a period of time, because I want you to have the opportunity to make decisions. Uh, that's why I'm going to do less. A third possibility is because I don't know what the hell to do. Right? Yeah, that, that's what um, I'm concerned about. I'm right. seeing, I feel. But like we could keep adding to this list and every conceivable reason for parents getting less involved is something we wouldn't want to endorse or condemn because of the behavior of non-involvement, we'd want to know what's going on. Sure. There may be parents who are afraid, you know, I didn't really like a lot of what my parents did to me, and I'm afraid I'm going to be reproducing that same stuff, so better to do less. Others um, are afraid of their own tempers, you know? I mean, again, each explanation calls for a different course of action. In my book, Unconditional Parenting, I have a whole chapter on why the hell does this keep happening? And I lay out different fears we might have, for example, or pressure to do something or not do something that we pick up from our spouse, from our parents, our parents-in-law, from uh, videos we've seen or parent experts we heard at a talk or whatever. The media, and yes, constantly media. saying, do this, don't do that. It's, it's confusing. Exactly. Yeah. So, for example, the current conventional wisdom is a deeply conservative attacking parents for being helicopter parents or over-parenting, and we should let kids trip and fall and pick themselves up on their own. 
And now I feel like my kid needs me, but I've, I've picked up, I've in, somehow absorbed this conservative conventional wisdom that kids are supposed to be independent as soon as possible and that there's something wrong if I'm helping them. I need to step back, even though my gut is telling me it's too soon, you know? Yeah. So, How does a parent know then, I mean, when, when is a good time to let the kids try stuff and fall down or to let, you know, as, you want to let them grow when they're ready, but yeah. not, but not um, you know, you don't want to be, my, my term of helicopter parent is sometimes it may be different than yours, where it's the, the person following their kid at the playground, like, oh, don't trip, don't, you know, there's a little too much at some point where, where do you, yeah. How do you find yeah, that? And, and again, there's no one size fits all recipe here for, for how to do that. I mean, one thing to check ourselves with is, um, am I making this decision of getting involved or not getting involved or how I'm getting involved based really on what's best for the child or is it based on my need? Some parents or, or some ideology so I'm worried. There are some parents who need their children to need them. Oh, I've seen and that. And the kid's yeah. able to go out and do this happily without it. it makes me feel like, well, oh, I'm being fired as a parent. You know, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, others have this ideology that kids ought to be able to be free range and and not need parents. Uh, you know, certain, when they get to a certain age for different things, and that gets in the way of what this particular child needs about this issue at this particular time. Yeah. Um, so if we're really doing it in a way that's in the kid's best interest and safety isn't involved, then we should probably err on the side of, um, of asking more than telling. I like that. Would you, would you like me? Can I, how can I help is a good, is a good question to ask a kid. Yes. You know? or, or do you need, would you like me to do this or would you like to do it yourself? And if the kid says, I want you to do it, okay, that's all right. You know, your kid's not going to need you to do it 10 years from now, probably. Hopefully. <laughs> don't worry about creating dependence. Okay. And conversely, if your kid says, I want to do it myself, and the chances of injury are low, bite your tongue, <laughs> your palms, and watch, you know. <laughs> Start by, by responding to what your kid's telling you. Um, makes sense rather than imposing on the kid either getting involved or deliberately not getting involved. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Oh my goodness. Well, it looks like our time is already up here. I think I could chat with you forever. Um, we touched on at least a lot of the topics I was hoping to cover today. So, but I know people can um, visit your website, which there's uh, a link with this interview um, in the email, but at uh, alfiecone.org and they can see all of your, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, it's K-O-H-N for those who are just yeah. watching. Listening. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that they can get uh, links to your books and you have articles on there. Yep. Um, a lot of information. So, I, and like I mentioned before, and um, Alfie mentioned that there's a lot of uh, research studies in his book, so you can follow up on that. But yeah, no, I think I think the main point I got um, today was that you know parents can really, if they can listen to their children, and like you said, ask instead of constantly telling, and try to follow their lead to um, encourage them without uh, praise, <laughs> but encourage them to grow and develop and be uh, happy people. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully we can uh, help them on their, on their own little journeys, so. Right, that's right. Kids learn how to make good decisions by making decisions, not by following directions. Sure, I like that. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, yeah, be sure to go visit his website and there is a wealth wealth of knowledge out there uh, that he has for you. So, all right, thank Good. you. Thanks for your interest. I appreciate it.